symbol of liberty under law. The myth around Magna Carta is astonishing. The things that are said about it quite often don't actually correspond to the text. I just want to give you a few examples. First of all, it wasn't unprecedented. Henry I's uh, Charter of Liberties contains much that was in Magna Carta, and it itself drew on the ancient Saxon liberties. It wasn't a grant from a wise and gracious king. It was actually an appalling monarch who, amongst other things, had signed away the independence of his crown to a foreign power. Who would have imagined anyone should do such a thing? I meant to share with you. Yeah, I meant to share with you something that Hume wrote about him. But in the interest of time, I'll just show that with you personally if you want to see it later. But it, John was a terrible monarch. I am not much interested in his personal opinions. It was not. This document was not the product of a disinterested group of altruistic liberals. They were a wealthy elite at the top of a feudal system, in many ways asserting their privileges and correcting a system largely of oppression for many people, so that it at least worked for them. Ladies, it did not deliver equality before the law. Consider clause 34. No man shall be apprehended or imprisoned on the appeal of a woman for the death of any other man than her husband. <laughs> well, that's and because they had to fight duels, and it wouldn't be fair on the woman to have to fight a duel. Possibly so, but my point is this, that Magna Carta, for all that it is a great symbol of liberty under law, did not implement many of the principles which today we take for granted. And of course it was quickly annulled when King John appealed to the Pope that he had had to sign it under duress. But so what I'm trying to say to you is this, in making what I realise are quite controversial points about Magna Carta, is that insofar as it is a great symbol of freedom under law, in many ways it's almost by accident. In some ways we stumbled through great events and somehow produced this document signed by a bad king, by interested parties, and yet it became the foundations of our liberties. Our liberties under law. So what then is this origin of the authority of this law? Is it the prerogative of the king? Well, if Magna Carta teaches us anything, surely it's that everyone is subject to law, including the king. So it can't be the prerogative of the king. Is the source of law the reason of philosophers or the will of politicians assembled in Parliament? Well, I hope you'll agree with me, there wasn't a Parliament at the time it was signed, and it certainly wasn't the product of uh, philosopher's reason. This is an idea, this idea that law is the product of parliament and of reason is actually a relatively modern one. Actually, Magna Carta was the confirmation of ancient practice. A great constitutional theorist called Sir Edward Cook described it as a restitution, a confirmation of ancient rights, a confirmation of the law of our land. This then is the origin of the rule of law under which we have our liberties. This is the distinction between common law and civil law. The law of our land is the law of ancient practice, the law of custom, the law of, uh, uh, of rules which have suited people over many generations and found through long experience and gentle modera uh, moderation and change to be those laws with which best suit a free people. And it is that gradual development of beneficent rules since time immemorial which gives the common law its authority. It is implied consent by obedience to rules rather than a consent which emerges through elections or the good graces of a sovereign. And I'll just put to you that I think at the time the evidence is that the that people were appealing to the, the liberties of the Saxons. And if you look at the literature of the 17th and the 18th century, scholars were again looking back to the liberties of the Saxons. Here's a thing, it's just a speculation. If the Saxons didn't just annihilate everybody in Britain when they arrived, it's likely that they intermingled with people whose practices, quite possibly, were a remnant, remnant of the Roman era. And of course, the Roman era will have had a, a, as its law, civil law. And I just wonder, ladies and gentlemen, if actually the common law of which we're so proud might just have not be merely uh, a transplanted system of perfection from the German forests, but also might have echoes of the Roman system. But the point is this, over the course of very, very many years, a set of laws emerged which supported liberty. Now, why? Why should the English people over the course of many generations choose to live free, to exercise their own will, to guide their lives on the authority of their own intelligence and not subject themselves to the will of another? Well, I want to give you two reasons. The first reason is that liberty works. 
in every nation where liberty has been extended, however imperfectly and incompletely, <coughs> the condition of the people has improved. The richness, the complexity, the productivity of human re relations has risen. The people have become more prosperous, more peaceful and more civilised. Ladies and gentlemen, liberty works. And the second reason is that liberty is moral too, because liberty involves the freedom to do what is right. And that, to me, is human dignity. Not doing what is right because you've been forced to by another person, but doing what is right because you know it to be the correct course of action for a moral person. And so the complete fulfilment of our morality is to actually choose that right course of action. So despite all our flaws and all of our vices, Nevertheless, therein lies the root of our law and our liberty. The dignity of having the choice to do what is right and the moral fulfilment of actually doing it. Now, why is any of this relevant today? We've got three problems today. First of all, we can't, the welfare state is not good enough. If you look at the social protection budget, it's about £16,000 for every person in poverty. And yet, even in Wickham, people go hungry and homeless and offenders continue to re-offend. The welfare state is too expensive and it's not good enough. Secondly, we cannot afford it. You will know that last year we overspent by £108 billion. The education budget's 91. We spend more on debt interest than we spend on defence. And thirdly, insofar as we have been able to afford the welfare state for so long, it's been by debasing the currency. And to me, I could speak at greater length, but I need to cut this short. Many of the problems which today cause such a sense of injustice and cause so much jealousy, which have undermined our social system, which have caused a wealth distribution which quite frankly in many cases will not be just, arise from 40 years of easy money. And what answer have we chosen? Yet more easy money. Ladies and gentlemen, the guiding principles of our age right now have become expediency and ambition. HMRC is about to receive powers which it ought not to receive in a free society. Easy money's still propping us up right round the world. In the United States in the six months to June, 73% of their government bond issue was bought by the central bank. It is an astonishing fact of our life today. Our society is in the process of exhausting all other courses of action before doing what is right. So let's remember that when Thomas Jefferson said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, he was actually inspired by an Englishman reflecting on the ancient constitution of our country, Viscount Bolingbroke. Viscount Bolingbroke wrote this, Though the branches were locked and the tree lost its beauty for a time, <clears throat> yet the root remained untouched, was set in a good soil, and had taken strong hold in it, so that care and culture and time were indeed required, and our ancestors were forced to water it, if I may use such an expression, with their blood. But with this care and culture and time and blood, it shot again with greater strength than ever that we might sit quiet and happy under the shade of it. For if the same form was not exactly restored in every part, a tree of the same kind and as beautiful and as luxuriant as the former grew up from the same root. In this place, 799 years ago, a great document was signed. A flawed document signed by a bad king under duress from probably self-interested individuals. And yet it gave us this great principle that our liberty, that great source of our prosperity, that great source of the fulfilment of our morality, comes from everyone being obedient to the law. Once again, this great tree of our liberty will flourish in this country, of that I have no doubt. Once again, we will assert that it's this England, this law, which is above everyone, is the basis of our liberty and our prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.